if you hear anything in the background, I don't have a choice, okay? Spooky season's done. I swear I'm not doing this because of that. Trust me. So, time loops, according to an article on Substack by someone named Katie, are a metaphor for love and growth. Or they're a vehicle for it. I didn't really get the memo at first. It felt like a reach. Like, I could see where it was going, but it seemed a bit much. Either way, in the article, Katie analyzed various time loop narratives. Happy Death Day, Groundhog Day, 12 Minutes, Jorah's Mask, and today's topic of interest, Oxenfree. I've played Oxenfree about eight times now? Published by Night School Studio in 2016, it rode the high of most choice-based games like Mass Effect, Dragon Age, and literally anything made by Telltale Games. With a twist, of course. But I'm not here to talk about gameplay. Everyone said what needs to be said about that, from the length of the dialogue tree to true endings to new game plus, even about the committed ARG community they cater to so much that the game itself has reached other games. Testing. Alex? Jonas? Hey, Alex? Guys, do you copy? Please. Oxen Free is a story about a group of teenagers fucking around on a military base and awakening a bunch of vengeful ghosts that plan to trap them in some weird dimension where time doesn't exist. Strap in, because I'm about to unleash about five years worth of ranting onto you. Spoilers ahead for the following media currently flashing on screen. I can't promise to keep things minimal since a lot of time loop narratives hinge on plot twists, but I am a firm believer that spoiling is just a ploy for views, so. Now, there aren't a lot of rules to ghosts in fiction. There are plentiful ghost tropes out there that rarely even have anything to do with hauntings. So, souls made amoral and or downright malevolent due to years of neglect and misremembering of facts? That's fine. That's not even a new concept. The crew of the USS Kanaloa like to insist that there was something beyond dead, left to relive the moment they died over and over and over again. A little like the ghosts of Corpse Party. You know, interdimensional teenager killings and all. <laughs> they don't want anything, hate anything, or even necessarily do this to Alex and her friends for any sort of self-gratification. The mixed science fiction aspect makes it so these ghosts are trapped in radio waves, forever in limbo until someone tunes into the right frequencies in order to hear them. And that aspect lends you a sense of sympathy up until you realize what that can do to someone. Well, 97 someone's. They were in stasis long enough that they forgot their own names, and now all they know is their eternal deaths. No longer the crew of the USS Kanaloa, the Sunken, a sort of hive mind of entities hellbent on embodying the idiom if misery loves company, triumph demands an audience, want someone to know what it's like. And it's with these facts that I started wondering what the real goal was with the Sunken. Ghosts in contexts like oxen freeze usually have a core of regret. They're used to symbolize a desire to maintain the status quo, never changing and never moving forward, always looking back and, you know, something that is usually negative to a narrative of progression. Time loops would seem to hold a similar purpose, seeing as the radio transmission anomalies look back and they repeat their deaths over and over. But narratively, it really doesn't. Under sci-fi time loop conventions, Oxen Freeze has a gradual learning curve. Alex, and the player, has to learn specific actions to leave a loop, where only small sections of time loop over and over, and the memories of the previous loop are retained. But as in the rules of causal loops, players aren't allowed the knowledge of what caused the initial loop and what series of actions will break Alex out of it. With the sole exception of a New Game Plus ending where Alex can warn a version of herself from the past to not go to Edward's Island while she herself is trapped in a different self-originating time loop dimension. And before I get too deep into the time loop theorems, I want to bring back our original point. Oxenfree's time loops often have a gradual learning curve. Ghosts, as we've established, symbolize a desire to maintain, to stay 
to linger. A learning curve suggests progression. So in that sense, Oxenfree isn't necessarily a story about vengeful ghosts cursing a bunch of children to repeat their night on Edwards to make them experience what the sunken felt. No, no, no. Because when you end the game, whatever futile choice you make, Alex is still stuck. Not dead, just trapped in a different dimension only accessible through specific radio transmissions trying over and over to break her friends out not knowing that they already have. Okay, maybe kind of dead then. Here's where it gets interesting. If you play it right and appeal to the Sunken's individuality and humanity before the finale, they let Alex's friends go of their own free will. Again, this is a loop of Alex's last night on Edwards. We think her friends got out because their reactions to us stay the same. The only ones who change are the Sunken. But when Alex appeals to the Sunken, they soften a little, remember their humanity. And this, this looping reality where Alex's memory restarts over and over but she still has the ability to change the way she acts and reacts to the story, to not have it just be a continuous loop of the same memory, well, it seems like a type of twisted pity the sunken would show the newcomer who seems to have sacrificed herself for her friends, giving her a modicum and illusion of control over this hopeless situation she pulled herself into. That's right folks, this is SJ's oxen-free conspiracy video. My theory is either the original Alex died with an overwhelming sense of desperation to save her friends and this looping reality is a result of ghost Alex manifesting the same abilities as the sunken, or the sunken is letting her have these to keep her semi-mentally stable for longer because getting pulled through the dimensional rift didn't kill her and because she was nice. If you have your own theories, please let me know. I don't care how you do it. DM me on Twitter, send me an anon on Tumblr, or curious cat. <laughs> just please, just talk to me about this. <laughs> There's a very odd mechanic to the game where you get to bring Michael, Alex's dead brother, back to life. You can do it through a series of flashbacks where Michael asks you what he should do and it sets up a big expectation that hey, if Alex can talk to Michael one last time, can Jonas talk to his mom one last time too? Of course, if you haven't finished the game a few times yet, you'd think that was the case, but no. Michael's dead and he won't be coming back. But let's walk you through it. You bring Michael back to life. It's not a very fun ending. All those hours you spent with Jonas gets erased from everyone's memories and gets substituted. In that reality, Alex wasn't the one to bring Jonas to Edwards. Ren was. And all the shit you did, traipsing around the island to save everyone, it's all with Michael. A guy you, the player, don't really know much about apart from what Clarissa and Alex have talked about and through those brief flashbacks. And this sad and desperate bid for your dead brother's life in a fake reality actually brings up one of the things I hated about playing through Life is Strange, yet another story about causal loops and false realities. There was an entire segment of the first episode of that game that was completely optional. You could run around as Max, make friends with all the cool people Max never made friends with by abusing your rewind powers. Then, they bring all of that back in the last episode to guilt you into thinking that all that rewinding caused this storm that's about to wipe out the town. But since that former scene was optional, that latter scene rarely ever makes an impact if you play it through. Using hindsight to avoid reaping the consequences to your actions is one of the worst things you can do in a time loop narrative. In my humble opinion. It's very... It was all a dream seems a bit too good to be true. Actions should always have consequences, and whatever decision you make, giving you the ability to pull back and change it will either make things worse or make you worse. The Call, a 2020 film by Lee Chung Hyun, kind of almost did the same thing. Except since it's a film, nothing is optional and you can actually watch the impact affect all characters involved. Yong Suk tests out Soyeon's time theory by saving her dad from a house fire about 20 years in the past. I say kind of almost because when it changes Soyeon's present and ultimately pulls her away from Yong Suk, the sci fi story turns into the horror thriller it really is, and Yong Suk does something way worse to the Kim family than a house fire. Actions 
consequences. Causal loops make that role abundantly clear, considering the main feature of it is the eternal feedback loop of future actions having consequences in the past that affect the future and so on and so forth. And Oxenfree doesn't shy away from the very literal meaning of the word loop. Alex's actions during the denouement of the game seem to have some kind of effect in the past, especially if you actually follow what the Alex in the reflections say. Don't make Michael stay, he should keep dating Clarissa, let Jonas talk to his mom, etc, etc. But no matter what future Alex tells past Alex, you're faced with the reality that nothing you do in the past matters because you're stuck in a loop and you just have to deal with that. But if you're playing this RPG style, deciding to act and react based on what you think Alex might do, things get a little interesting. Knowing that Michael will die on a swimming trip with Alex and forcing him to remain unhappy and unfulfilled in order to keep him safe fits Alex if you play her as humanly flawed as possible, seeking comfort till the end. It's delicious character writing and honestly incredible role playing in the player's part. Cause when they hit you with the wake up call, it just breaks you. You, not Alex. Michael's dead and whatever Alex does in her timeline will never be real because everything loops back again and he'll be dead again. It's a punch that keeps on swinging and I admire that Adam Hines stuck to it despite the discomfort it brought so many players who were searching for an optimistic ending to the game before that mechanic of calling past Alex became an option. It's, as my friends and I would call it, evil and nefarious. I've talked about the way the sunken are trapped in radio waves. It's a play on the fact that Edwards used to be a military base slash communications hub in World War II. There's some neat commentary in this game about gentrification and military imperialism as well as some fears related to scientific experimentation around anything nuclear. The crew of the Kinloa died because their signal was too garbled around all the radiation that the reactor powering the submarine was emitting. The military base in town thereafter was shut down and Maggie Adler, the lady who sent the signal to terminate the Kanaloa, made sure that no one else had access to those caves after the sunken took her friend, Anna. Apart from the military imperialism, I'm not really qualified to talk a lot about that. And anyway, that wasn't my point. Fort Milner used to be a radio communication school for the army, and I suppose due to the nuclear reactor in the USS Kinaloa, that's why the ghosts manifest through forms of electricity, radiation, and magnetism. You have the magnet tape recorders that fix time every time it loops short segments in the game. What's funny to me is that it's like the sunken just ejected the tape so they could make Alex fix it and put it back because the tape's all loose. I'm assuming because of how many times Alex has looped through her final night. Then you have the anomalies and radio transmissions scattered around the island. Little bits of fucked up little recordings. I know with Oxenfree 2 about to come out, the dev team's been scattering anomalies and easter eggs from the next game into this one, which suggests that since Alex opened the dimensional rift and has been fixing all these tape recorders in her own loop, the energy's going bonkers on the island now. Did I bump the mic? Didn't seem so. Some of these anomalies are call signs, the ones you can use to appeal to the sunken in the climax. Some of them are fucked up versions of the audio guides around tourist spots on the island. There is this one from the forest that fucks me up every single time. George 3. Ah, it'll be good having somebody else here to watch after the ground, Bill. I was at Park Warden in Grants Pass, so this will be old hat to me. William Marshall, a local park ranger working in Edwards Forest, killed himself today after what his wife describes as a years-long battle with depression. His body was found hanging from a tree in the- Then you have the film tapes in Maggie's basement that showed the characters the bunker on the island and Anna, and all the locations of the triangle portals Alex has been opening all over the island which they've all opened by then. What's fascinating to me about all of this is the longevity of these items and how even in the barest bones of them, the sunken manifest their way into reality through units under the same predicament as they are, radiated and recorded down onto a tangible form. Recordings. Always there, eternally, tangibly, just looping in on itself, whether or not you press play, pause, or stop. They're always going to be there, whether or not you listen to them. And they're never going to stop looping. 
It speaks to the immortality of literally anything recorded in history. This video is going to be on the internet until the internet itself dies and still then it will exist. Your favorite songs, your favorite audio dramas, shows, films. This isn't the Schrodinger's cat situation. The fact of the matter is that now this exists and you can't unmake anything you've made. It remains forever made until you tear it apart and make something new with it and still then it will exist just in some other form, remaining in the motions, not remembering what it used to be. I'm getting existential. It's 5 a.m. at time of writing, 1 a.m. at time of recording, so sue me. There's a lot about the story I didn't get to talk about. The character writing in and of itself is a marvel, really, and the dynamics between Alex, Jonas, Ren, and Clarissa are incredibly interesting. No offense to Nona, but there is literally nothing there. <laughs> I know someone already did a deep dive into Alex and Clarissa's portrayals of grief. I recommend y'all watch that one. It's really good. All in all, this game just has a very special place in my heart. Right next to Little Nightmares. Okay, I know I told you I wasn't doing these spooky reviews on purpose and that hasn't changed. I just really like these properties, regardless of them being horror. I mean... Where else would you get such a robust thought experiment on human selfishness, indulgence, desperation, and the intangible immortality of memory and legacy? In a teen horror! Oh, right, right, I forgot about that! Anyway, I'm glad you guys got this far. Likes and comments are appreciated. Share and subscribe if you like the vibe. A big shout out to Jeanette and a very, very big thank you to my patrons. If you want updates, early access, extra content to get a neat little shout out, or maybe just want to be able to control what comes out next on this humble little channel, please consider backing me on Patreon. I also take donations through Ko-fi. I just opened them monthly, so if you want to get on that. If you want a tip, you know, consider that. Stay safe. Ingat tayong lahat. Bye!